All right, functional programming, even sourcing. So there's a lot of materi material here, so I'll try to fast talk fast. But if I'm talking too fast, just let me know, like be slower. Um, eventually some concept might be, you know, you might know it. So if you do, just let me know, like, like tell me skip it or whatever. Uh, I'll be eventually asking some questions, so don't fear to raise your hand saying I know it or I don't know it. I will not be pointing fingers, but just I have want to know the general idea, well, what kind of audience I have, so I can either skip it or talk in some details. All right, functional programming. Functional programming. So, how many of you guys could give me like description what functional programming is? So, like, yeah. All right. So, is functional programming programming functions? Or is it using streams with map and reduce and filter? Or is it what? Is, is Java A the functional programming language? Is Scala functional programming language? All right. Um, um, so I'm not going to give you the definition of functional programming, but I will tell you why I love functional programming. So the thing that drove me towards functional programming was actually for the last like five or eight years, I was writing them horrible, horrible code, like the, the worst that you can do. And the thing is, I wasn't the only one, like each of my colleagues in every company was doing the same, the same thing. And it wasn't that we even try, I mean, we tried really hard. But if I go back in time, like look what the things I did like three years ago, they're like, ah oh, shit, that was crap, right? And the thing is, the thing is that if you go, for example, to Uncle Bob's presentation about TDD, you remember those? That was so cool, right? He was showing you how he'll be writing a Fibonacci sequence function, or he would be showing a sorting algorithm, writing tests, and regarding of he, whether he will start with those tests or the other, he will eventually have sorting algorithm working. It might be a bubble sort, it might be a quick sort, but eventually he has this base of tests, he could re-implement everything inside of it. The tests were still green, he was happy. You went back home, you went to your company, and apparently it didn't work. Why? Well, I will give you an example. I don't know if you guys see it, hopefully. All right, imagine that we have a user. The user has an ID and a first name and a last name. And there's a cache where you can actually ask for the user within the cache. We either are return with an option, user exists, or there's no such thing as a user there. And also the cache will be modified. Uh, because if you were looking for a user with an ID 10 and you find that user, you will increase the number of hits. If it wasn't there, you will just increase the number of misses, and that's it. Uh, we have a repository. We have as a repository where we'll be looking for our user. If we found our user, we'll also put him into the cache. Uh, so we have a cache as a dependency, and we have a um, class user finder, which have those injected with some whatever dependency framework we have. And then we have a method find user, which basically uh, checks for the user in cache. If the user is found, it will return the user. If it isn't, then it will try to look for the user and insert him into the cache. And that's it. The problem is, is if, if you start writing the tests for this, uh, for this kind of uh, software that you just created, I will, I will argue that tests will always give you some valid points about the code you've written. So if you start to write those tests, eventually you'll end up with things that Uncle Bob didn't tell you about, like mocking frameworks and stuff like that. You have to mock all those guys to actually test this method. And even the tests will be green. You'll have like full 100% coverage. Everything is working. You maybe have even branch coverage. Awesome. But the only thing that they do, the only thing that they do is they, they are testing whether this function is doing a sequence of operations that you intended it to do. This implementation might be falsy. You will have 100% coverage, 100% branch coverage, but the implementation might be wrong. And why is that? Um, the, t the thing is that we, we brought th those two guys together. The dependencies, which aren't incoming somewhere here as a parameters, they are injected by our framework. And they suddenly are leaking towards our implementation. So I will say what, what functional programming gave me. Well, they gave me no concept of time, no concept of dependencies. The idea is quite simple. If I have a function, and that function takes an input, it will always ret return the same output for the same input. So if, if it returns something, whatever, like for, for input three, it will always return B. There's no, there's no like, 
if, if the sun is shining, it will gonna be three, but if it's raining, then it's four. It's always like this. And this is quite awesome because now I can have a function G, which takes an input, something that I took as the output from the first function, and returns an output. And if that thing also is uh, something that you guys hear as a pure function, if that always behaves the same way, then now I can reason, reason about something more complex. So I can look at those guys combined together as actually a new function that takes the original input and gives me the, the last output returned by the function, the function G. And this is modularity and composition the way you would like to have it. So if you have, if you have any modules and they have their internal state, which might change over time. So you put some initial input, it changes something internally. So the next time you do the same input, the answer will be a little bit different. You might test it, right? You might have your testing environment looking at the module as its own. But then you, you push it back to your production and you have those different modules running and the complexity is suddenly not in your module because that guy is tested. The complexity is suddenly in the communications between those modules because at at some point on production, you're gonna get this event. The event can come from a user and it completely destroy the whole thing. And you're like, what the hell just happened? You try to run this on the staging environment, on the test environment, and it works. Why does it work? Because all of those components, they have all the internal state and they all together com combine the super state that can take like million of different values. And the bug will only occur on two of those. So that sucks. And functional programming gives you this modularity by default. Because once I've tested that for whatever input, I will get whatever output, I can reason about the more complex stuff. So that's one of the things I really like about functional programming. Um, the other one would be, um, can you guys tell me what this function does? I will give a beer. Now, I have three beers after last night. I will give all my beers if you guys tell me what's the implementation of that function. You might be saying, like, <laughs> he's, using, he's using comments, right? Because we know about comments. They suck. So um, I will try to remove comments. Now, can you guys tell me what this function does? Nobody. Yeah, what does it, what does it do? Oh, eventually it sorts the list. So apparently, apparently a name of a function is also a comment. I know you wrote it and it was reversing the list, but you weren't writing tests for reverse, right? There's no point. It, it's just reversing the list. But there was this junior guy, right? Always junior, yeah? Not you. You change something. And, but the name is reverse. It has to be reversing. No, it doesn't. So another question. Can you guys tell me what this function does. And let's just imagine, let's just imagine we are in pure functional world, like now, world like right now. So for a given input, you can only provide output. So there will be no, no changing to database. You cannot ask random services out there. You cannot use function random even. Because random by default isn't pure, right? It can give you different results each time you call it. So what's the output of this function? Awesome. Apparently, this is identity. I can call it blah blah, but just looking at the looking at the types, I can actually say what that function does. Uh, and if we and if we try to put a little bit less, uh, make it a little bit constrained. So if I change a whatever generic a to int, can you guys tell me what that function does? Well, at some point, it will give me some end value but it always be the same value. Right? So the thing is, this thing over here was A. I have absolutely what, no idea what A is. It might be string, it might be int. I cannot do like A plus one because A might be a user without method plus one, so that will not compile. If I have an int, so I'm, I'm constraining my types a little bit, then I know, all right, I have an int and I have to return an int. So there's no other guys that I can ask questions like any other functions, any other dependencies, the only thing I could do is either return myself, add some calculations to it, like plus zero, plus 10, divide by something, or simply return a constant value. That's all things I could do. 
So the cool thing is with functional programming, which I find really useful, is you can combine functions, and you actually can understand what they are doing just by the, by the description that you see. Whatever the name, types that are being taken as parameters, and the types are be that are being returned. So I was at this conference, and there was a guy showing this in Haskell. And I was sitting there like, I wonder if I could have this automatically generated. Apparently, there's a mode on Emacs for Haskell that does it. Like, you provide this, and it will give you the possible like, solution that you can provide, which is crazy. All right, so this is a quick, uh, this is a quick introduction. If you guys are more interested, there's actually a cool, uh, cool paper uh, written by that, by that guy in 1988. And when I learned it was in 1988, I was like, well, nobody showed me that when I was at the university, right? This, this sucks, man. Um, and it's like a soft introduction. It's like f maybe six or eight pages to read. It's really nice. If you guys want to be really, really hardcore, read this paper. It's still draft, so the guy is still working on it. It's supposed to be 300 pages. <laughs> Are apparently right now 100 and something, but you can call it a patterns for functional programming world. Um, at this point, I will call it math matters because you, you reach a point where, where stuff that I was supposed to be learning back there matters right now. And if you just hate papers, then you can read blog about this guy's really cool blog post. Uh, it, it, pro it, it gives you basic about Haskell, but also talks about types. So it, 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 it gives you the knowledge of Haskell, but from the point of view of types and stuff like that. All right, so functional programming. Awesome, right? But the thing is, uh, there's a problem with functional programming. You cannot absolutely do anything with it. Like in the real world, everything is changing. So how can we actually just do something useful? So those guys who are doing functional programming, they find a loophole and they realize that, well, if we could provide functions as parameters, then we can then we can actually postpone the changes as a parameters. And so they did. So let me show you this example one more time. We have our user. Um, the, 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 the function is modifying cache, but we don't want it to be modified. We don't want to change our, our outside world. So what can we do about it? And apparently, there's only one thing that we can, do, we can do about it. So we have to just look at the time, because damn, is time is flying fast. All right, so what can we do about it? The only thing that actually we could do if we want to st still you know, provide the same functionality and we want to be functional is do this. So we have a, our user. We have our cache. Uh, we have our tech. Uh, function which takes the ID the user we are looking for but also takes our cache as a result give us the result that we are looking for previously but also provides us the cache that was modified just like that so we'll be will be we might the implementation might give us a new copy of cache that is being changed so for example if the user is found then this this cache will be copy of that one, but with hit counts increased by one. And we have a retrieve function as we had before. And again, we take cache as parameter, we turn, return our result, but we also return modified cache. And how the find user function will look like, exactly the same, get a cache and provide our result with modified cache if the cache was modified. So we, so we check for our user, we provide this cache object over here, so we have our result, the cache is being changed, and the user may be user. And then we pattern match. If we find the user, awesome, just let's return the modified cache and the user that we found, correct? Uh, and if there's none, well, then call our retrieve function, which will call some repository or whatever, and, and return the value plus the cache that we modified. Uh, like the signature is exactly the same as the one here. So the return value of this function is is this, which is the same. All right, you guys see it? Seems reasonable, right? We can work with it. The problem I will find, uh, the problem those guys found like 30 years ago, is that this guy over here, if I make a mistake, if I make a mistake, like like simple mistake, I was typing and I was, uh, you know, drinking beer or whatever, um, I might forget and I might pass here, not the changed value C of cache, but the one I, I was provided as parameter. So if instead of providing this changed cache from function check, I will say cache over here, the compiler will tell me nothing about it. He'll be like, all right, this is awesome, it works. What's even worse, if you run it this way, 
it will look as if it was really working. If you go with production with it, it will be working because the only thing that you will lose is the hit counts and miss counts. So the things that were modified internally by this function. And you can imagine this is a really simple example, but we, if we have like many of those methods, when you have to push the state through the functions, this, this mistake, it might be easily to make. I mean, you might write it the, for the very first time quite good, but if you try to refactor it, the mistakes will be there. So, as I said 30 years ago, or even more right now, uh, those guys thought about it, and they realized they are working always with a function that takes a state and returns the modified state plus, plus the value that they were really interested in, right? That's, the, that, that, that's always the same signature, right? So they thought, like, this, this is the signature that we are looking at every time. And the problem is that we, if that, the first function returns a new state, I have to pass that state to the other function, which is exactly like this. This is the place where I will make my mistake. And, and I am only chaining those calls to those functions. So they thought they will introduce um, let's say a class. And Scala, this is a class, um, which is parameterized by S and A, which correspond to that S and that A. And, and this is the tricky part for the first half of the presentation. The only thing that you have to remember about this guy, he looks scary, but it's easy, really, really concept. Really, really easy. This class <coughs> wraps, basically wraps that function. So you have that function, whatever it is, whatever it does, one of those functions that you see before, and it's wrapped within the instance of this class. It's lying somewhere there, you know, just chilling, waiting to be called. All right, that's it. So we have this function being wrapped inside the instance of this class, awesome. At some point, we would like to call this function that is being wrapped, right? So we have a method which is called run. This is a method on this class. So if you have some function which is being wrapped inside the instance of this class, you call it run with initial state. What it will do internally, it will call this function with that state. That's it. So we had a function. You wrap it up in a class. Uh, and we have a method that can actually call this function. And you guys might be like, this is stupid. What for, right? Because we could, at some point, just run this function. I will show you that, guys, in a minute. So there are two additional functions. One would be one would be map, and uh, you guys, sorry, you guys have to, I have only two hands, so I just realized there's like another crowd over here. Um, sorry. Damn. All right, um, I'll be just running from one side to the other. Um, all right, so we have a map function, and map, what it will do is internally you, you pass a function as a parameter which takes A to B, and what it will do, it will give you a new state, S from B. So you can imagine what it will do internally is that once you run this function, this will give you S and A. It will call that function on A and provide the B. As simple as that, right? And we have another function, flat map. You probably know where we're going towards monads. Um, so it takes a new uh, function as a parameter, parameter as well. But instead of providing us B, it actually gives us yet another object that wraps a function within state S to B. All right, this sounds and it looks weird, so I'll just show you guys the code. So we can imagine we have an object state with a method apply. So we, what it will do, it will take this function that we want to wrap inside the instance of our class state. All right, so uh, the implementation is quite straightforward. We just make a anonymous uh, class instance state S of A. We have to implement the run method, and we're just saying like, you know, if you run it with S, then call that that f function, and it will be it. Easy? Like I mean, it's uh, like the simplest Scala that there could be. Maybe not the simplest, but I think it's sort of comprehensible. And Scala might be weird sometimes. Um, all right. So, but in Scala, this thing could be a little bit with sugar, so we can get rid of apply. Uh, and and uh, Scala compiler will understand that at this point we are calling compile. So if I have if I have this function from cache to uh, cache plus uh, get uh, by ID, I can wrap it inside state object by simply you know opening braces. This will call this apply function and create me a state class uh, instance. All right. So uh, let's look at the state really quickly. 
Damn. Um, so we have a run method. We have map me the run method will be always abstract, but we have to provide map method. So if we want to implement it, we just have to follow types. So you guys see we have to return state s to b. So let's just do that. We have state. The state takes an s and has to provide a new state s and our value b, right? But the question would be, how do I get b? Well, the only place where I can get b is from this function f. So let's just try to call our function f on, va on some value a. What? what? Okay. Blah. Blah. Compiler, blah. Uh, so how can I get my a? Well, I could only get a at this point if I run this method, right? So that's what I will do. I will run my run with initial state, I will get the result, and just at the very end, just pass this new s, and that's it. Just by following types, we just received the implementation. And actually, there's no other, rate or other way to implement it if you wanna, wanna be pure functional. Like, if you provide better solution, I will give the free beers. All right, and flat map will be something similar. So we already, we need to return a state s to b, but we have function that will actually return s to b, right? So we just return the result of that function. We need a, all right? So we run this one more time. We have s of a, uh, but we need s0 at this point, all right? So where will we get the s0? Well, we'll just wrap it around state. But at this point, we have a problem because we are already wrapping around state. So we have a function that does something and is wrapped within the state. But the result, return result is also a state. So we have a state of state, right? So if we just call, <gasps> what I done? All right, so if we, just call, if we just call run on it, we will eventually get the, we will run the function that is hidden with, with inside that object. Do you guys see it? Any question whatsoever? Because that, that probably the, the, the basics for the other stuff I will be telling. And you guys like, should I leave? Will he be angry? You can leave. I seriously no. If 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 you guys want to leave, I'm always like like people are scared of leaving conferences because this guy's gonna be sad. I'm not gonna be sad. Is there gonna be like three of you guys left? But three guys are really interested to what I have to say. It's from my point. It's better if you just go to the other conference that you uh, the conference room that you like. So. Go if you need, but I know that you can win those free beers, and there will be other questions, and I know you guys are waiting. Um, all right, so let's go back to our problem. So we had those functions, which were exactly from S to SA, right? And we had a problem of passing a state between the calls of those functions. So what we could do right now is wrap each implementation of this function with, within the state object. So as you remember, state which is called state monad. I'll try not to use it, but it is a monad. Um, if you wrap it around state, uh, each of those functions, uh, it will look like this. So instead of providing the implementation, we, we wrap that implementation within our state object. And the same thing goes both for check, retrieve, and our find user method. But this, mo this time, we can use something which is Scala is called for comprehension or in Haskell do notation, right? Uh, so if we, look, if we look at our state, which is calculated over here, the thing that we will get on the, on the left side of the arrow is actually only our A. The, the state, the, the passing of a state is implicit right now. So let's look one more time. If I called checked before, I was given my user, my maybe user, and the state, cache, right? That was my result. And then I had to pass that cache to yet another call. But right now, that state is being passed uh, implicitly. I no longer see it. So I only retrieve the value A, the, actually the thing I'm interested in. I provide initial state. Right? Some, somebody will call this function, will return state. Somebody will actually call run on it. If he will call run on it, he has to provide initial state. With that initial state, we will get check method, which will give us only the value A, maybe user. And the same thing will happen over here. So having, having a maybe user will pattern match one more time. 
if we didn't if we didn't found anything, we'll just call retrieve, which again gives us a uh, a state object. If we did found them, well, it's awesome. We did found them. We have them. We, this is the thing that we are interested in. This is the guy we're looking for. But for this thing to compile, the, f the thing on the right side of the arrow is also have to be on, of that type state. So only thing we have to do, we just have to create a function that will do nothing with the state, right? It takes a cache, does absolutely nothing to the cache, and returns the user that we are interested in, right? And at the very end, the thing over here, which we return a user, but that thing is going to be wrap it up again to the state object. And that's it. That's all about state monad I would like to tell you guys about. And in a moment, you will see why. Ooh, all right. Just have to drink for a second. To doom, to doom, even sourcing. So how many of you guys seen uh, Greg Young's talk yesterday? Majority. Yeah, and you're just wondering, this is going to be the same shit, is, right? Um, yeah, it will. So if you guys want to learn about event sourcing, like go to this truck driver. Probably he will teach you more than I know. I'll just provide you basics, all right? So event sourcing. Event sourcing is always cool. It's always, wow, event sourcing. Let's do event sourcing. Actually, event sourcing is driven by business. Whenever you go to some like mature industries, they, they're using more or less event source, some event sourcing more way or the other. But it was always because the driven uh, it was driven by business. Business had some needs, and they were all be able to be provided by this way of architectural design. So, how many of you guys understand event sourcing? Like, know what it means? Half of the room. So you guys are okay if I just quickly go through through the description. So I'll I'll just run through the examples and yeah, if there is any question, just shout. I have a question. All right. So so the example that we're gonna use is uh, application bloggers conf app. And and if you get me drunk enough, I will tell you why that example was created on GitHub. But right now, just imagine there's this kind of application, and we have uh, functionalities. We need to create account for our bloggers. We need to list our bloggers on our application. Well, some bloggers like each other, so we, we need to have a way to actually have provide these functionalities. I like this blogger, or maybe I don't like him, or maybe I hate him, or I just like him one more time. And at some point, I'm just going to deactivate the account because application is stupid. Um, so how we can actually provide this functionality? Well. When I went to the uni, it was always like this. Well, you have to think of your data, of your tables. So we have our bloggers with the first name and last name and information whether it's active or not. We have a table of our friends. So right now, I know that this guy, Małgorzata, uh, she knows she has a friend, Janek. Awesome. And the same thing will go for enemies. So this is our structure. And now we can implement functionalities on top of it. Awesome. But apparently, structure does not matter. If we look at the problems that we have, uh, at some point, st structure would, will change really frequently as com compared to the functionalities. Like Functionalities might be not changing over time at all, but the way how we interpret data internally, how we structure it, will change. So in event sourcing, we start to thinking about facts occurring in our system. And, uh, and we derive structure from that fax. So just give, let me give you an example, because I was supposed to go in fast for it. So imagine how we do, that we have an event that the blogger account was created with an ID 3. Then he befriended some other blogger with ID 1, and then made an enemy with blogger with an ID 2. With that list of events, if I was able to save that sequence of events happening within my system, I could then reconstruct that information into the tables that I am familiar with. So blogger account was created. Um, he befriended some guy, and he made some enemies. I can actually destroy that table, replay all my events, and I will have exactly the same structure. All right. The question is that Greg's always ask is like whether those two are exactly the same. Again, you can buy one beer. Win, win by beer, sorry. Are those two the same, or are they different? Right. It depends. Beer, all right. Um, 
All right, so it depends because if we derive structure the way that you guys seen before, the structure for those two guys will be exactly the same. But we just lost probably one of the most important fact that those guys used to be friends and now they are enemies. From the point, from the point of perspective of our table, they were just happened to be enemies and that's it. But no, there was this hate, love relationship between each other. It's, it's a fact that we are losing if we don't provide event sourcing. So that, that's why I said like it is driven by business because it's the only model that would not lose data. That's it. All right, so quick example, like enemy of my enemies is my friend. So we'd like to have this new functionality with our, with our application implemented based on that. Well, it might be easy. So like you're gonna, you're gonna look for search for this table and maybe like compose it with that table. But then if I make my requirements maybe more complex, like could you traverse the whole graph of people knowing, hating and loving each other? This is gonna be fun, like it's gonna be like select what, select, and in that select there's gonna be another select, it's gonna be awesome. So, we could actually look at this problem from the graph perspective, right? We could have a different structure, something lying in parallel with our relation model, just for this one particular functionality. I could recreate the graph model, like nodes being our bloggers and arrows being whether I like him or I hate him. So if I, have, if I have my user, my blogger here, and I, at some point I will see that this guy with ID4 hates my enemy, and he's actually befriended by those other guys here as well, but that guy hates this guy. So um, at some point, at some point we, we see the soap opera happening here, like, like maybe she's married to that guy and like this is lover or whatever. We, we don't care about this dude. We can see it from the picture, right? We, uh, if I show you an SQL query, maybe like three of guys would be like, yeah, awesome, SQL. <laughs> uh, but from the picture, I would argue, I can easily say like, those guys should be friends. If, if I was to propose like, maybe you should be interested in that guy because you know, there's the thing going on and you should be aware of. All right, so benefits of even sourcing, ability go, back in time and figure out what happened if you have a back in production because you have all list of the events that happening on production. You have scientific measure measurements over time. You have built in audit log. It's an audit log that works because that's the only way that you persist information about things that were happening within your system, all right? So there's no be like, oh, I just forgot this annotation log in that's that one particular method, sorry. It was running for a few months with it, without it. Um, it enables temporary querying. So I would like, like to know, like, imagine I need to know about users who said at some point DevOx, then they said, I know, happy and then beer within 10 minutes. That's something really, really easy to do uh, with event sourcing. And fits well with machine learning. So one of my friends actually asked Greg at some point, like, I've heard at some point that you can actually do a machine learning on history of events. And he was like, yeah. So why aren't you guys talking about it on conferences? And he was like, well, because the ability to predict future is the one place that you actually earn money. But you know, probably the most important point here. Um, and yeah, you preserve pre history. So there might be questions that you don't even right now, right now know they'll be asked but they will be asked two years later, and you will have ability to answer them as if they were implemented from the day one. Um, and writing regression tests is easy because if you have some weird bug happening, you just take, take the events from your production, put it as a regression test, fix the bug, and the bug will never happen most of the times. Uh, and drawbacks, there are some drawbacks. Historical records of your bad decision. So imagine that I've uh, made implementation mistake, so I've, uh, I had an event blogger initialized, which took like ID, a first name and last name. And my implementation was it takes, instead of providing first name and last name, I provided provide first name and first name, right? And it was running for two days. So if I had just a SQL database, what I will do? Four users from this and that, update whatever, and just never happened, right? It wasn't me. But if, with event sourcing, when you actually cannot delete events, because the whole idea is that you have this history, you have audit log that you know it is correct, right? So at this point, the only thing you can do 
is you can add an event that will fix this. You can add like a first name changed event, right? But that mistake is in your in your persistent journal forever. People are gonna be laughing at you five years later. Um, because Git his history you can actually change, right? Git history can be changed, but not with that. All right, so uh, also you have to be aware of ha ha handling duplicates, which will eventually happen in distributed system, and you have to be aware of data eventually consistent. The data is eventually consistent. It's something you should be telling your business apparently, which is for some reason really hard. Um, all right, so the question is how to implement it. I have some code examples, and damn it. And uh, what, 20 more minutes, awesome. Do I still need to use microphone? Yes, thank you. All right, um, oh, it's actually no ID turned on, sorry. Hopefully it will run. Yay. All right. Let's just close that. Uh, I will turn on the presentation mode in a second. So I, yeah, I've never done that before, programming with a microphone. It's going to be one, two, three. Good. Yeah. Now I know I need to check it. Okay. So um, uh, the thing is, the thing is, um, when I was first introduced to event sourcing, uh, I've looked at the examples that they were on the web, and they looked more or less like um, this. So this is going to be an example, which is built on top of the ACA persistence. Do you guys know ACA persistence? You guys know ACA? All right, ACA. So, the only difference is that the events that are being passed to the actor, the messages, are being persisted in the, some kind of journal lying below, the, that, below that actor. So if the actor is killed and he wakes up, he'll be given all the messages that was previously passed to him so he can recreate some internal state that he was having. So you can imagine like whatever he received at some point he, and he, he dies and he goes back up, he re, he'll receive it one more time. So. So this is how I was introduced to um, to event sourcing, how to implement it. Apparently with domain-driven design somewhere in the back of my head. Um, and, when I, and when I understood that, that the majority of examples will look the way I will show you right now. This is actually, this is our befriended bloggers example, but this is a ripoff for something that you can actually see on the types of activator. It's a ripoff. It's a copy paste of the solution. And if you hear about if you hear about event sourcing, you will hear that event sourcing is supposed to be like knowing the current state is only a fault left over the events that happened in your previous life. And Greg Young will tell you this is something easy for functional programmers. And I had this like weird feeling, okay, so Event sourcing should be easy for functional programmers, should be like the same thing, but all the examples are with the domain driven design in mind and object oriented. So that was weird. But the thing I didn't like, so, so let's, let's look at the, our example. We have our blogger, this is our state. So he has some friends, uh, first name, last name, some friends, some enemies, and information whether he was activated, yes or not. Um, we have some comments, uh, oh sorry, I think before I should, should show you that, I think I, there were some slides I was missing. Yeah, oh, awesome, sounds nice. So quickly, uh, how to implement it, we have comments and events. So we have journal, the journal, sorry for that, yeah. Third day at DevOps, things might happen. Uh, so those are the events that uh, we persisted previously, all right, in our, in our store. This is that they were stored at some point. And we would like now to recreate our blogger to, to have its current state. So we have initial state of our blogger, which is empty, ID is empty, first name, last name, list of friends and stuff like that and the events are arriving. So the first event said on journal already was that user was initialized. So we apply that information to our state. Then there's the other event. Well, he befriended that guy number with ID 10. Awesome, we put that into our state as well. And the last event that we saved was also some other friend that he befriended. Cool, that was the events that were being saved to our journal previously. But now there are some new requests coming from 
REST service or whatever, and there's a comment saying befriend guy number with ID 31. And there's a difference between event and a comment. So comment is something you're saying, make it happen, but it might not actually happen. So it, look at how it's say, befriend, do it. But the events that we had saved were named befriended. So we are saving in a past tense. It, it already happened. Why, why is it different? So this is actually things that we know that happened in the past, but now there is a comment. And before we apply anything to our state, we first do a validation. And apparently, for some reason, business logic, we don't care at this point. We, not, we should not allow add, add a new friend if he already exists on the friends list. All right? This is our business case, whatever. So we say, no, validation didn't happen. Sorry. And the, the, the command that was being passed is just simply ignored. But there's the other one, just be friend number 34. The validation is correct, awesome. So the thing, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna push that event to our journal, save it once that information is saved and we are acknowledging that fact. That's the moment when we actually can apply this to our state. And this is more or less how it's implemented, yes. Uh, so in this example, you are losing information that someone was trying to uh, twice the same guy and why is it different so so yeah so the thing is I all right so I tried to create some simple example I just said like this is our business domain that we don't care we yeah we could we could say like he was befriended twice yes that may be not the best example I choose yeah you might be have the, the the list doubled we could have those events saved twice the thing is that you, you don't have to be remember when I think those two two commands are happening because this event happened twice or maybe we just received the duplication, duplicated command over the network. Or we should fire an event like uh, uh, some, uh, you try to befriend a, uh, befriend a, a friend already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, uh, this is all right. So the, the idea of this example is just to show that there is a validation in front of saving the event. Maybe not the best example for a validation. Maybe I should choose something different. But just the, the, the idea that before we save anything, we first validate our, our, our state internally. All right, now let's see some code. Sorry. This is so cool. Uh, all right, so, um, what, 15 more minutes. Um, so, we have our state. So this is our list of our, our comments. Um, and as you can see, they all extend comment. You will see in a moment why. Um, and as I said before, this is a report from TypeSafe Activator, object-oriented, and has one Perfect thing in it, you will see in a moment. Um, and we have a list of events. So we have a comment initialize, and we have events saying that the user was initialized, befriend and befriended, and stuff like that. Uh, and we can now uh, create, uh, so maybe here, we have, a, we have a class which is called blogger aggregate, which extends aggregate root. But if we go to aggregate root, we will see that aggregate root is a persistent actor. All right, so as I said, it's an actor with an ACA who which will remember all the messages that were being pushed to him at whatever time in history. Um, all right, so um, so the thing is, we have, uh, we have this method, we have this method which is called received comment. And it is a method that will gonna be called each time we just receive a comment, all right? And the only thing that we are saying right now is that whenever this is called, then actually called init method, all right? So we have init method up here, and we see that if we um, if we're gonna receive a comment initialize, then two things should happen. First, try to persist that event to your journal. All right. Once that is persistent, so ACA persistence gives you this uh, this uh, robustness that uh, the method provided as the second parameter here will only be called if that event over here was persistent in journal. So you know it, it's already persistent when that is called. That function over here is actually implemented uh, within, the, within the blogger, sorry, within the aggregate root, the one that we were extending. But the only thing that it will do, it's, uh, the only thing it does is um, it calls one method that we are interested in at the moment. I will just maybe show you. So it does some stuff. But the only thing that it is doing that we are at interested at the moment is called update state with the event that we just were passing, were passing through. 
And as you can see, update state is not implemented. You have to provide that method on your own. So, so having said that, one more time, we, we've, we've, we've received a you know, command initialize, we've persisted an event initialized, and having that being acknowledged, then we will call method update state. And where is update state? Well, it's over here. So we are saying at this point two things. If event initialized happened, then a state would be our state, our blogger would be just a new blogger with an ID, first name and last name that we can read from that event. And we are saying one more additional thing. Right now, whenever somebody is calling the receive command method, it's no longer in it. Right now we are saying, um, we are saying become created, which means that whenever new event will be happening, it will not be calling the, the method in it, it will now be calling me method created. And then we get receive yet another event like befriended and friended, and the, the same thing happens all and all and over again. All right? So you might be arguing why this is wrong. And as I stated at the very beginning of this presentation, tests will always tell you something about your code, especially about its smells. So if we look at our, our test base of how we actually, what the hell, uh, how we can actually implement it. So based on, yeah. So if we look at our states, uh, our, our tests, we see that there is um, there is some stuff going on. There is an actor system happening, some timeouts, some execution context, all right? This is weird. We have to shut it down every time we te and add a test. All right, well, the test looks quite easy, right? I mean, let's maybe let's look at like some other over here. It isn't that bad. I mean, there's some manager. I haven't seen him before. Wonder what's that? Um, they are pass then I pass some some command initialize what what was this thing called begin i haven't seen that begin and it's closed under commanded is that somewhere on production code no apparently commanded will hide all crazy stuff happening like you know waiting for results and different kind of things like all right having that understood at some point i want to see what this create manager is and i see all right there's the class actually in production code blogger aggregate manager Okay, so he has some methods, uh, propos, pro okay, so it looks that probably he will be receiving comments and maybe passing it to my actor, let's see that, awesome, well this is new and a lot of new code happening, kill children if necessary, that's awesome method, great, yeah, let's do that if necessary, let's kill children, um, so, alright, so this is a lot of code that has to be running, if you're using Akka persistent, I understand that. But I will argue having that in my tests, just to make the tests reasonable, having the timeouts in my test, this timeout might, you know, might, might fail my tests even though, you know, the test was okay, but maybe there was garbage collection happening or whatever, like I can imagine on, on continuous environment system. So I will always argue that whenever you try to right application on top of the framework you're gonna be screwed at some point how many java developers are here awesome keep your hands up how many of you guys ever use spring yeah was that cool at that time it was cool did you change your job eventually yeah because you had your application on top of your framework putting all the functionalities above it and if I will now tell you, can you just switch the framework to something newer or maybe newer version, you will say like, <laughs> impossible. Are you a professional programmer? This is crazy. No, it's not crazy. I, I believe we can write software where I can actually test my, f my business logic without the frameworks. And the framework being my infrastructure that will run my logic. So having said that, I will guys show you the next example. So this will be the same thing that we've seen over here, the object-oriented way. I, I still have 10 minutes, right, correct? Yeah, awesome. Uh, so this will be the same thing, more or less object-oriented, but we will go towards two things that I miss in the implementation provided. The one would be, first of all, I hate the fact that I'm mutating state all and all and on, because I don't know if you guys seen it, but 
um, this class over here, like whenever we do something new, uh, we just say like, all right, this state is now a new state, right? So we mutate internal state within the actor. So I would like to go somewhat go towards immutability, and also I would like to uh, maybe, maybe, well, sorry, call me maybe. What's going on? Ah, okay. Uh, and maybe, maybe have this code um, without frameworks on top of it. So there's a O version frameworkless. Let's see how that looks. Oh, sorry, it's in tests. I have it in production as well. All right, so, so. We have, well, again, we have our state, which is blogger. Uh, there's an uninitialized, un, uninitialized state for blogger being empty. These are our events. Good. What happened to comments? Well, comments right now are actually methods. So I'll still have my blogger aggregate, which is always initialized with some state blogger. If I don't provide it, then it's initialized with the uninitialized one, all right? I have my comments, but right now those guys are functions. Can I can call them on blogger aggregate. And the only the, oh, there's one more difference is that I'm not mutating myself. I will not mutate this blogger state over here. Instead of doing that, I will return a new instance of blogger aggregate with the uh, blogger being changed. So let's have an example. Like imagine that we already have like blogger initialized and we are will be calling befriend some guy. So what we will be doing, we create an event for that comment happening. We apply that event to a method update state. But you see that update state all that all it does, it maps it maps the event to the new state that should be created. So for example, if I um, sorry, presentation mode. So if I, for example, befriended somebody, then let's create a new instance of blogger, new instance. But we will change one thing and one thing only. We'll add this friend ID to the list of my friends. Awesome. Simple as that. Cool? Is that cool? Uh, hopefully. If it's not, sorry. Um, so, but if you look at the tests, and at this point, my, I was really, really bored. So the test started to be looking like the script for a movie, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So you have you have uh, John, which is being initialized, and he was befriending Jane, and at some point they are not friends anymore. But, okay, so there's this test at the very end, which te takes the whole script of the movie, love-hate relationship. Um, but the idea is that those tests are right now running without without any framework whatsoever. Does it mean that I will not use ACA persistence? No, because right now implementing ACA, th this code upon the ACA persistent will be easy. I will create the whole infrastructure I was creating before. So managers, you know, killing children if necessary and stuff like that. But the only, the only thing my actor will actually do is it will call method on, on that class and whatever was returned as a value, that state will be mutated, saved internally, and that event will be persisted. All right? And also check this out. If you look at our tests, right now, right now those tests are only testing that thing we are really concerned. You guys don't care at some point how make enemy is implemented. You don't care. The only thing that you guys care, you guys who's gonna be maintaining my code after two years when I'm still in some other place doing some other job, the only thing you're, you're gonna care is like, after calling this method, what event will be generated and how, how my state is gonna look like after this thing happening. That's the only thing you guys are interested in. I can change implementation of that method as long as those two uh, verifications are correct, then we are good. No, no it, and it is a unit test which take to actually test the things that you are doing, not the way that it is implemented. But if we still having five minutes, if we, so why the hell we are talking about the state mono thing? So if we look, if we look at our methods right now, um, 
at some point you guys are gonna realize that we have we have a state right and calling a method which will give me a new state and something that was being calculated that sounds familiar right this is something like this dude was telling me 30 minutes ago I thought it was boring but damn this is actually something we can use like functional programming can be something that we can use in production let's see so the last example that I will show you guys is the, exactly the one so blogger is simply a structure nothing to it right blogger initialized the same thing that we've seen before but now we're gonna see this happening all right so um, we have our events the, the, the same events that we've seen before and now we have a method which is called apply event and the only thing that that method does just just try not to focus on the implementation yet the only thing that it will do it will map map the event the event that you provided to a function that will return a new state and that event that's only it it's a mapping so right so it's a the function is being closed inside state monad here the function is being called is cl closed internally but that that's the function given some blogger and the event initial event just you know once once it's run with the blogger then 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 return this and that having that method if we've seen it, if we understand it, it's basically mapping events to, to calling functions, and it's already closed within state object. The function is closed within a state object. We now see that the sentence that Greg was saying, that creating current state is basically fault left over the events that happened in the history, well, it's exactly here. Fold left over the events, and for each event, apply the event. That's it. So we, yeah, we, we, we get some list of our events and we get the initial state and we just run, oh, so S is a list of events that we, for example, received from our journal. So our journal is, gave us this list, right? So the only thing that we have to do is fold left over that list, so go with each and every event and apply it to the state that is being passed around. But the cool thing is that apply it is already here implemented. So let's now look how our comments look like. So our com comments are simply functions that we've seen before, which will apply the event with the event that we that we provide. This code over here looks it's a little bit more verbose than it actually could be, because instead of doing this, I could actually what I could actually do is instead of that this code, I could actually say this and that and this is also sorry without without run at this point I can I, I can say that initialize initialize comment will be applying the event initialize like return a function at once provided with initial blogger will create me an initialized blogger that's simply it. the only reason I have it like this is that this code is as you could probably notice haven't doesn't have any validation whatsoever. So this code is being prepared for the validation, but I wasn't able to provide the whole example. Sorry for that, because this is the place where we would probably first be validating our event, not returning yet the, the blogger, but maybe some validation of blogger or whatever. But this is this is what, we, if, if I would have not, no validation whatsoever, I could just have it like one line of code. And, and, if you have a little bit of fun with, with, with stay monads and with functional programming, this looks really, really awesome because now you can imagine, like my test at this point will look like this. I know I'm running out of time, just give me one minute, all right? And I'll be, I'll be done. So my test uh, at this point will look like this. So uh, I don't know if I have this example over here. Yeah, so um, I have it, just one second. All right, so I could, I could be calling, I could be calling my 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 comment initialize which gives me which gives me a state object so the method is closed within the state object and then I just run it with an initial an un, initialized state right so Johnny here will be my state after being initialized but right now if I would like to test a sequence of 
comments happening. So I would like to test the whole scenario of Mr. and Mrs. Smith movie. I can write it as a full comprehension without state being passed around. I'm just saying that there was Johnny, Johnny fell in love, not so much, betrayed, forgave, fell back in love and went for retirement, right? And at the very end, I can test that Johnny at some point should look like this, should be named Johnny Smith, loving Jane and having no enemies, and also the events that were supposed, sorry, the events that were supposed to be created by this sequence of running comments should be as that. But if you guys know, for example, uh, property-based testing, like property-based testing, are you guys familiar? Like, for example, if I want to test my reverse method, if it's working correctly, so for I have list and I want to reverse it, and I want to be sure that this method is working for any argument I provide. What I can actually do is instead of writing unit tests, I can create a generator for my list, like create random generator, all right, of whatever list. And I would say, I would on the, my test would be like only this. If I have random list generated, if that list is being reversed, and the result of reversing is being reversed one more time, then this should be the original list, right? The same thing, if I reverse the list twice, then out the output would be the, the list that I provided at the very beginning. And that's property-based testing. So the generator, the generator will create you like hundreds of hundreds of examples. It will create your big list, empty lists, list with one element and stuff like that. And it will just test the properties of your system. So now can you imagine that with this solution, we could actually write property-based testing for our comments. So I can imagine that I have a random generator of comments happening. And I could have, and I could have a command which is called deactivate, right? So I might say, my, my only test that I would write would be whatever history of random events happening, comments happening, if then we're gonna save deactivated, and there was some other random lists of other events happening, applying those should always trigger validation. I cannot longer apply anything to this user because he's deactivated, right? So the single line of tests with, with this API. Um, and as I said before, um, we are missing read models because those are important in event sourcing and we are missing validation. Hopefully, at some point, I will add them. But that is all, folks. My name is Pavel Schulz. I run a blog. I have a Twitter. And also, I have a GitHub account, apparently. Thank you very much.